Thank you, Brecken. That was a great uh, introduction to why we're here today. And we're really excited to talk about uh, apprenticeships and what they are. So I'm going to kick us off with a video uh, that kind of showcases some of the things that are happening uh, on a national front that we would really like to see here in Utah. And I think it speaks to the value of youth apprenticeships. And you'll see why we wanted to talk about this today. So if you're better with me, I'm going to show my screen here. Please be patient with me. This isn't uh, starting the way that I thought it was going to. There we go. Sorry about that. We've got 23 apprentices. We've hired five more. If you could please tell us one word to describe youth apprenticeships. Transformative. Growth opportunity. Equity and opportunity. Success. Youth apprenticeship programs are work-based learning programs that are designed to start when an apprentice is in high school. They provide paid on-the-job learning under the supervision of skilled employee mentors with related classroom-based instruction. Youth apprenticeship is a powerful strategy to overcome inequity in access and opportunity to good paying careers with high paying wages. We need a broader vision of what an apprenticeship is and how it could feed our future economic strength. We have a lot of work to do to educate people about what apprenticeships are. You know, this is not an internship. We want you to actually hire this person. I think we all have this notion of apprentices who are blue collar workers, whether it's in construction or electrical, etc. There's some stigma or just confusion with what is an apprenticeship, right? Or is it welding or something in the trades? And we know today's apprenticeship really cover the entire landscape of banking and business and hospitality. IT, insurance, financial services, any business you can think of. School district leaders said, how do we really make high school relevant for students? Then we start working with our students when they're in the 10th grade. They are taking the juniors in high school, training them, giving them the professional skills they need to come in and start growing with those businesses. You learn those skills that then could lead to other essential skills and work. You know, I can give you an example of, of a, a young guy who tells a story that he was ready to drop out of high school and now he's designing bots. Through the apprenticeship model, we give students an opportunity to learn and earn at the same time. They could be getting college credit at the same time. So it's not one or the other, they could be doing both. Another way to get to college and to have something that a lot of other college students didn't have and a lot of their high school students just don't get to experience. They're able to spend time in the workplace, developing the experience that's so essential for their future. companies gain because they get a talented workforce. The importance of being able to grow our pipeline of talented workers, given that we've got an aging workforce. People leaving work faster than their qualified replacements were becoming available. By building the youth apprenticeship model, we can continue feeding the pipeline for the businesses and, and hopefully overcome the low unemployment rate issues that we're experiencing right now. This creates a whole new pipeline uh, for talent in our organizations that are really starting for it. These are young people that not only are already contributing to what we're doing, but they are stepping into the middle class and the notion that we're giving people that are going to be contributing greatly to our business and being in the middle class. It's a really powerful story that we're very excited about. Our apprenticeship programs need our focus now. 
New America and its partners launched the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship, or what we call it, PIA. We will be working to support states and cities to expand high quality youth apprenticeship opportunities across the country. So the reason I wanted to show that, I'm not sure if you know. Are you looking to start an Amazon business? Don't be like Joey. Why do I say that? Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, the reason I wanted to show that video is uh, because we are a part of the PIA network and not everyone realizes that we are. Uh, but the advantage to this is that we are linked to, up to other states. So I don't know if you noticed in the beginning of the video, it had a map uh, of the United States and it showed everywhere um, that is a part of this network. There are some individuals or some states that received grant funds and others uh, like us that, although we weren't funded, they are including us in the network and we have resources that we're able to tap into to provide technical assistance for us to build programs here in the state of Utah. So I'm really, really excited about that. But when we talk about um, apprenticeships, we also um, need to define what they are because everyone has a different view or perception of what uh, they have been compared to what they, because of what they've known about them in the past, but they are also often uh, interchangeably um, used with the term of um, internships. Are you guys seeing my screen now? I've lost you guys, so someone please speak up. Yes. Yeah, we Thank can you. see it. <laughs> okay, so again, when we talk about um, apprenticeships, um, we want to make sure that we define them so that we're all sharing the same message and have the same goal and we know what they are. Apprenticeship in of itself is a training strategy that's going to help prepare students. It combines on-the-job learning with classroom instruction and in this case even their academic learning as a part of their high school um, course completion that's required for them to graduate. So when we are developing programs, we're looking at making sure that all three are included uh, for youth in order to be successful. Um, but the difference between an internship and an apprenticeship is basically with an internship, they're usually short term in duration. They may or may not be paid and they may or may not lead to full time long term employment with that employer where an apprenticeship is an employee. They receive all the same benefits that other employees do because um, it's a paid position. And 92% of um, apprentices that, that complete their program have been um, proven to stay with their employer. So I think that speaks to uh, the validity and the quality of the type of training and investment that they receive. Uh, from that employer and that they want to stay on with them. With an internship, especially at a high school level, we see these often used as um, ways to um, do some career exploration. Maybe they want to try two or three different things. They don't really know what they want to go into yet, um, but we know that um, they should have these experiences. So by the time they do um, join an apprenticeship program, they're ready to make that long-term commitment. And so we'll talk about some other strategies later on what we want to do to help them prepare to make those choices and uh, what supports we can put in place to help them be successful when making those choices. So these are the components that make uh, an apprenticeship high quality. Uh, there needs to be paid structured on the job learning. There's the classroom based instruction that usually teaches them the technical skills to do the job. Um, but they're also uh, showing that they are becoming competent in what they're learning. So uh, they have the hands on learning, but they're applying the things that they're learning in the classroom directly on the job. And because they have a mentor, they're able to show and prove competency that they are getting, they're getting it, they're getting what they've learned and now they're able to apply it to the job. They also receive incremental wage increases that are commensurate with the skills that they do develop once they show that they have proven that competency. And then it also culminates in a portable um, 
credential or industry recognized uh, certificates. And in the case of registered apprenticeships, they also get a national credential that will allow them to not only work anywhere in the United States, but we also have reciprocal agreements with other countries that accept um, our apprenticeship certification because it speaks to the quality and the rigor of the program. So I think that's something that's pretty exciting and not everybody realizes that we have that opportunity and that's something that we provide with this. Uh, this just shows you a little bit about how apprenticeships are growing within the United States. We've had a 70% growth uh, in the last 10 years. And with youth apprenticeships, we've had a 25% growth just in the last year. So it just shows the movement that's taking place and the desire to uh, connect people earlier on and uh, get them employed and just get them uh, moving forward. Uh, Right now, the average age range in Utah is 24 to 35, and we're hoping to bring that down um, through youth apprenticeship opportunities. But not just because we wanna put people in a program, but because we want to uh, give them opportunities to enter into the workforce and receive post-secondary education all at the same time, instead of having to choose one or the other. This is a, a beautiful way that we're able to do this. But like I mentioned previously, we want to give them the support that they need and help prepare them earlier on through other types of work-based learning opportunities so that they will be successful when they do enter into a full program. This slide here indicates that nationally, um, the average wage for a completer, apprenticeship completer is 72,000. In Utah, it's 60,000. Um, and those um, are great jobs. Uh, when we compare that to what you need to rent um, a one or two bedroom apartment, uh, when you successfully complete an apprenticeship program, it shows that you have that affordability as to compare to those that don't. Um, and so it's something that's a great resource uh, for students and something for us to consider for them. In Utah, we just developed and launched our new website, apprenticeship.utah.gov, and a multi-mass media, social media, excuse me, campaign, um, trying to show people uh, the value of apprenticeship programs. This includes students, youth, adults, parents, educators, and employers. There's something for everyone. And when you visit the website, there's a whole host of resources and tools to help develop programs and to help you as educators see what your role can be in apprenticeship programs. Today, uh, we have with us Hunt Electric. Uh, we're gonna turn some time over to them to talk about their apprenticeship program and also what they do uh, in their partnership with Granite School District that leads students to that uh, program in terms of pipeline development. So Cody Eaton is here from uh, Hunt Electric. I will just turn the time over to you. Hey, thanks. How much time do we have? Because, I mean, we could talk apprenticeships. I mean, we might need to order some takeout, literally. <laughs> I, I do want to be respectful of your time, though. So really, what timeline do you want us to keep here? Uh, you have uh, about 15 minutes. We have till 4.30 for okay. all of our groups to speak. I saw a couple of members of our team are on here. We have Chris Olson and Tyler Stabley. Chris, you're always good to watch the clock, buddy. So chime in if I start running a little bit long. But um, we are pumped to talk to uh, work-based learning and educators uh, in our area. Literally over the five, last five, six, seven years, uh, work-based learning and CTE both, um, they're kind of synonymous in my head, even though I know they're different. Um, but you guys have really been the engine uh, behind a lot of our success uh, over the last handful of year, years. And we'll get to some statistics a little bit later on uh, in the discussion that will kind of prove that. Um, but working so closely with you guys has been um, just a joy for us. And so we're glad to be here with you guys today. Um, personally, uh, apprenticeship is something that uh, I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm a third generation electrician, right? So my dear old dad and grandpa, they were both Sparkies. Uh, and I have two sons who are actually coming up through the apprenticeship program right now. One's coming through the open shop, the merit shop, and the other one's coming through the local union hall. Um, so when we get together for Sunday dinners, there's some good banter back and forth about union, non-union, but uh, obviously we're a loving household and uh, it's a safe space. So um, all paths are good, right? But uh, the fact that they're coming through this uh, is fantastic. You know, I've, I've taken a personal passion to get the message out about apprenticeships because I, I remember, you know, when I was in high school, my senior year, um, there was just all that pressure to make a decision. You know, I was getting pounded by my parents and 
and hounded by my counselors and teachers, all lovingly, of course. But, you know, what are you going to do when you graduate? What's the next step? What's the, what's the path? And, you know, the 18-year-old kid, we all know how immature we are, right? Um, I'm in my 40s now, and I'm still pretty immature. But imagine me at 18, uh, and I didn't know what to do, frankly. And so uh, I did what a lot of my buddies did. We just rolled down to Slick, uh, signed up for fall semester, and, and thought I'd just start taking classes and figure it out. And literally, it was maybe, I don't know, six, eight, nine weeks into my first semester. And I was working a graveyard shift because, you know, I had, you know, bills and a car payment and insurance and stuff. And uh, so I was going, I was working a graveyard shift at a semiconductor company out in West Jordan. And then I was trying to go to school during the day. And, and literally, I, like two months into it, I dropped out my first semester. You know, learning in a textbook environment uh, is not a real good place for a guy like me to learn. Or I'm more of a hands-on kind of guy. And I wasn't really like engaged in that setting. All I knew is I had bills to pay and I wanted to go to work. So I ended up dropping out my first semester. Bounce around a couple of different jobs, you know, into my early 20s. And then all of a sudden I find myself, you know, with my first son, I'm 20 years old. I'm on a construction site downtown and I'm installing acoustical grid ceilings, right? Which you probably have an acoustical grid ceiling above you right now. And here comes these young folks, um, these electricians, and they're setting the light fixtures into this grid ceiling that I just installed. And lo and behold, these dudes are my age, right? And I'm 20 years old, and these electricians come in, and they're 20, and I'm like, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, yeah, we're doing the lights. I'm like, oh, cool, like, you're an electrician? They're like, yeah. And it, it, it dawned on me that I'd always just had this perception of electricians as being old, right? Because my dad and grandpa were old. So I never, I didn't put the pieces together um, that that could be a potential industry for me to get into. And so looking back on that experience, I was like, why didn't I never hear this? Like when I was in high school, no, no one ever actually even brought up apprenticeships, even my own parents, right? My dad was an electrician and he never said, hey, Cody, this maybe look into this path, right? I think they did what most loving and caring parents do is they say, hey, go to college because you can't screw up if you're going to you know, take any sort of education. That's a great path. So again, looking back on that, that's why I feel so passionate to get the message out to, to the next generation of workforce that there is another option out there outside of the traditional university or college setting. And no better person to know the next workforce than you guys, right? You, you see these students every single day. You get to know them. I would even argue that you probably know them even maybe slightly better than their parents, right? Because we all know they act differently. Um, outside of the household than they do when the mom and dad are around, right? So you get to know kind of their true colors. Uh, and so you see what's coming up into, the, into that workforce. And I'll bet you almost every one of you could look through your current, let's just say the next year's graduating class, and you know who the doctors and lawyers and scientists are. And you probably know who at some point is going to be incarcerated at some point in their life, right? You probably know who they are. But there's a big gap of people in the middle. Right? There's a big gap of pe people in the middle, just like I, when I was in high school, who aren't quite sure. They're not sure if the traditional college setting is the right path. Maybe they can't pick a major. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they can't afford it. Right? Maybe they're helping. They need a job because they're helping um, pay the family's bills or, or taking care of a loved one. There is a million reasons why. Right? Um, I think statistically, I heard that... Um, 50% of those who actually sign up in a four-year university type path, 50% um, of those actually graduate, right? And so that's kind of an astounding statistic. And I don't know if it's accurate, it's just what I heard. But that big group of people that has kind of got the big question mark, that's our target audience. And that's where the relationship that we've created with work-based learning from Hunt Electric to those individuals, they look at their student body and they're like, hey, this student right here kind of reminds me of Cody. This student reminds me of Hunt Electric. It reminds me of Tyler. And maybe I should make that introduction. And then making that uh, introduction, we can take it from there, right? Um, that's where we'll take over that heavy lifting and go from there. So let me give you just kind of a hypothetical of how it works from our perspective and some of the requirements from the state of Utah. So let's say your student that you see who would be a good candidate for Hunt Electric to start an electrical apprenticeship next year um, they're, they're on track to graduate because you got to be 18 years old and you have to have a high school diploma to come to work here and you have to have a good attitude. Those are the three requirements. Uh, life's too short. We don't want to work with bad attitudes. Neither do you guys. Right. So um, if they have those three things, they'll start uh, they'll start their employment with Hunt Electric. And we call that position a pre apprentice because you're not officially licensed yet by the state of Utah as, a, as an electrical apprentice. 
that starting wage is right around 15 to 16 bucks an hour, depending on experience. They're going to come on board as that pre-apprentice and we're going to put them in our prefab shop. And the prefab shop basically builds electrical assemblies that we're going to ship out to the job sites to be installed at some point down the road. So, but that prefab shop is in our campus. It's, or it's on our campus in one of our buildings in our warehouse space. And it's a very controlled environment. So those pre-apprentices, they're gonna get their hands on some of the tools. They're gonna to start learning some of the technology. They're gonna start meeting some of the people in the organization. They're gonna start rubbing elbows with electricians. And they're gonna, in the, for the, or excuse me, as a pre-apprentice, they're gonna be there for about four to five months. And so it gives them time to just kind of absorb everything, right? I mean, that's a, that's a lot going on. When you go right from high school to a job, uh, there's a lot there. So we want to give them a chance to just kind of, you know, yeah, absor absorb what's going on around them, pick up the vernacular. They may learn a swear word or two. I don't know. Well, frankly, they're coming from high school, so they'll probably teach us a swear word or two. But um, if they've done well after that four to five months in our prefab shop, then we will apply to DOPL, the state of Utah, it's the Division of Occupational Professional Licensing. And it's an app, a formal application process that happens where we put our name on this affidavit and we're saying, hey, for the next four years, we're going to supervise this individual as they come through the program. At that point, DOPL is going to mail them an apprentice license, and then they can legally install electrical uh, apparatus uh, and we'll ship them out to a job site. So now they're an active apprentice kicking butt out on a job site, they get a little bit of a raise because they got their apprentice license and, and they're out in the field environment at that point. The next step for that, there's two, two requirements um, the state of Utah requires for one to qualify to take their journeyman's exam. One of those is 8,000 hours of on-the-job training, and that is a licensed apprentice. So the pre-apprentice role, they don't get any credit for those hours for those first four or five months. But as soon as they're sponsored by Hunt Electric, they get their license, those hours start to accumulate. That's their day job, right? That's working Monday through Friday, uh, seven to four or seven to three thirty. It's a forty-hour work week, right? So those hours are going to build up, and generally it takes four years to get those hours. So that's requirement from Doppel number one. Requirement from Doppel number two is five hundred and seventy-six hours of classroom, college classroom instruction, and that either happens up at Ogden Weber, Davis, Slick, M Tech down in Utah County. Those students or those apprentices will go to school at night. Um, two semesters a year. So those 576 hours are divvied up over eight semesters at those colleges. So they can work during the day and get their on-the-job training. Um, and then they go to school at night. It's two nights a week, usually about two and a half hours per night. Uh, I'm not sure, Ogden Weaver, I know we got a representative on here, if that's close to what your class schedule looks like. Um, but yeah, they just, is that right? Yeah, sorry, Cody. It, we yeah. go six to nine, so that three okay. hours, two and a half hour range. Okay, cool. You guys are going the extra mile. That's killer. So let me back up a little bit. So you start a pre-apprentice, 15, 16 bucks an hour. You get your apprentice license. You get an extra buck, right? You made it five months. Great job. And then at the beginning of their first semester, culturally, this is a Hunt Electric culture thing because we believe there's um, a value to this. We make our apprentices pay for their semester up front. Um, we believe that there's value, intrinsic value, if their money goes on the line for that education. Because at the end of the semester, if they've done well and they get an A, we're going to give them all their money back, 100% reimbursement. If they get a B, they're going to get 80% reimbursement. And if they get a C plus, which, I mean, that's the bare minimum in my opinion, right? That means you made it most days and you did okay, right? Um, we'll give you a 60% reimbursement. You have to have a C plus to move on to the next class anyway. So C plus will give a 60% reimbursement. That's kind of a merit um, structure, if you will. You work hard, you get an A, you should be fully rewarded for your effort, right? So they pay for their semester up front. We reimburse them on the back end when they completed this, the semester. And they also get a raise at the end of every single semester. So they'll go, I think it's about a $1.50 uh, increase at the end of every semester. And that literally repeats itself for four years, right? So they're paying up front for the semester, they get reimbursed, they get a raise. Rinse and repeat eight times. By the end of that, Let's say they met the two requirements, the 8,000 hours, uh, 8, hours of on-the-job training, the 576 hours at the college. Now they've met the state's requirements to go take the journeyman's exam. We don't administer the exam. It's um, from a third-party proctor company that does that. But if they take their test and pass it, they're a bona fide journeyman electrician in the state of Utah. Right now, those guys are brand new journeyman today, tomorrow, if you graduated, you'd be making 
33, 34 bucks an hour, which translate for our people who are hourly, they're out there working a little bit overtime. That's right about 75 grand a year. If you started at 18, now you're 22 and you're making a livable wage. So back up to the scenario of the person who maybe couldn't afford college, right? Wasn't going to get a scholarship. Parents couldn't afford it. Now, if you think about it, this is what I love about apprenticeship so much is, and I wish everybody knew this, is now that person's 22. They're a journeyman, so they have a, a, an accreditation that they can keep for life. They're making a livable wage at $75,000 or so per year. Now they've matured a little bit, right? At 22, we've got a little life experience out there. We've, we've seen some things and, and done some things, right? Um, it doesn't have to end at journeyman. You've accumulated 40 credits of college credit because each one of those semesters is a five credit hour course. So it's not required to be becoming a journeyman, but if you choose to, all you need is another 23 credits of gen ed and you have an associate's degree in your back pocket, right? Which is awesome. And now, right, because you can work during the day as a journeyman, pay your rent, pay your bills, and continue to go uh, stack those credentials and continue with your education. Maybe you want to look into a bachelor's program. Melissa did your video or the comment earlier is we we put a tremendous amount of effort and and financial support into training these apprentices. We certainly don't want them to leave when they become a journeyman, right? Uh, our return on investment would go right out the back door. So it's up to us as an employer to create an uh, continued opportunity for them to continue to grow, right? So if somebody wanted to go into a bachelor program and, and take a construction management course, uh, a finance, business, um, marketing, HR, we have all those divisions in-house that we love to see our people continue and grow. And I also want to point out too that journeymen, when I say journeymen, you don't have to have a college degree necessary to go beyond that if you don't want to, it's not required, but that doesn't mean your career stops at journeyman. And I'll use myself and, and even Tyler on the call as an example. I'm a journeyman electrician. I don't have a college education, but I oversee operations for a company that's got over 600 employees and we have three branch locations in two states. And I'm like, wow, who would ever thought, right? I mean, I came through the trades and, and now I'm in a totally different business role. And it all was within, for the most part, Hunt Electric. I've been here almost 20 years. And there's so much opportunity in our industry. And it's so broad and diverse that, I hate just saying get to journeyman level and that's where it stops because it, it truly isn't. Frankly, that's where it starts because your training is now kind of behind you, right? Let me go to some of those quick statistics and I hope I'm going good on time, Chris. Be sure to chime in, buddy. I'm counting on you. But um, I, right now, like I said, we have 600 employees, a little over 600 at Hunt Electric. Over 50% of our electricians, our Salt Lake City-based electricians, were direct hires that came into that prefab shop right from your schools, right? Which I, I, that's why I say work-based learning is like, they are, they're our little secret, right? We love work-based learning because you guys know the workforce that we're looking for. And when the magic happens, when you guys know who we are and you see those students and you can make that pair, you, you make that match, you're the matchmakers, right? It's like the newlywed show, you guys are like the matchmakers between education and industry. When that happens, like some of our best staff right now and, and best teammates are right out of your guys' schools. And, and that's why we love you guys. So it, it's a really awesome opportunity we have to work together. The more we get to know each other, I think the more cool things can happen. Um, and it's just, I could go all day, so I'll try to just rein it in a little bit. But if you guys have any questions, um, we're here for you. I, we don't expect you to do all the heavy lifting. If you have students you want us to talk to, even on a one-on-one -on -one level, we bring them in, we'll give them a tour so they can see it firsthand. We do do summer internships. If you have someone between their junior and senior year who's interested um, and they just want to get their feet wet for the summer, we'll pay them 15 bucks an hour all summer. It's 40 hour work week. Um, they'll get a paid holiday because the 4th of July is a paid holiday for us. So they'll get to experience a little paid holiday. Um, and then they'll go back their senior year um, if they did well throughout that summer internship, we will make a spot for them when they graduate. And I was going to invite a handful of our guys that have done that exact same thing. A lot of them through the GTI program. Um, we have a great relationship with Vaughn and the team over there. They know who we are, just like I was saying. Um, and it, it, it's awesome, right? So the summer internship is a, an awesome benefit. We've even entertained work release a couple of times. But I don't know what's up with these schools now and this whole A-day, B-day thing. That just blows my mind, and it's really tough to manage. 
Um, yeah, because we do have a business to run. So uh, work release gets pretty challenging, but uh, we'll do whatever we can to get creative for the right candidate. So, so anyway. it does look like we have a question possibly from Tim Miller. Cody, love what you're saying, but man, you wore me out. All that energy. Are you sure you even need employees? Yeah, you know, I've had like four cups of coffee. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I just love this stuff, man. It, it, it is an awesome opportunity for people who just, you know, they, you know who they are coming through high school. They're just not sure what to do. And let's get them to journeyman level and a little life experience and then then go off. Like, what's the stat for somebody? Well, I think I already talked about it. Uh, Melissa, I'm, I'm sure you probably see this question coming. I really do want to understand this. Uh, so two days ago, and I'm hoping you can just bridge the gap between what you were telling us two days ago and what Cody was just telling us, because what Cody was telling us, I can identify with that. That's the law that I know and understand. You would need to be 18. That's on the books. But you were saying that if you became a registered apprentice with the Department of Labor, then you could actually get out there and start working ahead of being age 18, even as early as 16. Can you bridge that gap for me? Yeah, How do you do it? sure. So it, it's actually in federal regulations that if you are in a registered apprenticeship program, um, you can start at the age of 16. Now, there are a certain number of occupations that are considered hazardous occupations. If it's part of a registered apprenticeship, there are, I want to say, five of the 11. I'd, I'd have to go double check. There are seven of the 17. Oh, seven of the 17. Thank you, Sandy. Seven of the 17 where there is an exemption and you would be allowed to still work in that occupation, even though it's considered considered hazardous because it's part of a registered apprenticeship program. Now, there are some others that the, the other of the 17 that you will not be able to work in until you are age 18 because it's a safety issue. And, and so really we look at uh, and the reason they allow that for um, registered apprenticeships is the one-on-one -on -one mentoring that takes place and the structured learning um, that goes with that. So when you set up an agreement with the apprentice and with the employer, there's agreements on both sides of what they're going to learn and what they're uh, what the student is going to learn and what the employer is going to teach and then what's also going to be taught in the classroom. And so because it's structured that way, um, that's what helps um, allow some of those students to be able to do that. We can send you the um, the regulations. I have a fact sheet from the Department of Labor that I'll, I will put in the chat so that you can see what those are. So real quick, like from Hunt's perspective, unfortunately, I have to answer to my insurance guy. And he's like, ah, I don't want the liability of set, you know young kids running around your office. However, keep in mind those, those summer interns in between their junior and senior year, we recognize they're 17. And we kind of arm wrestled our insurance company to let those young folks come into our building. We do not let them run any of the equipment, so forklifts and stuff like that, heavy power tools. We don't let them do that. They just basically will use general hand tools like a like a small impact screwdriver and a hammer and stuff like that. So we kind of flexed our muscles a little bit against our insurance company. That's, a, that's as good as we could get. So Cody, um, because I do this with you, um, we talked to the kids about the fact that this is a long-term interview and yeah. they, they better be good for you. But the other side is, it seems to me you help them move to the apprenticeship faster. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. We So I, one thing I did leave out is a couple of years ago, we adopted, because we, we're always looking for continuous improvement and, and how can we you know, uh, invest in our people. So we created a, an academy. Uh, it's internal to Hunt Electric. And it's literally a combination of hands-on training. So not only are they just building those uh, electrical devices that we're gonna ship out to the job site, one day a week they spend with an actual instructor. Um, and they, they're starting to learn about the National Electrical Code. They're getting some hands-on training of how this electrical stuff even goes together. They're not fabricating anything for the day. Um, just so, and they don't get credit from the state. Doppel doesn't recognize our academy. This is just something that we chose to do as an investment. So that when they transition to the field, you know, there. <laughs> if you could imagine being an 18 year old and you go to a job site, um, especially if we have like some 26 story high rise downtown and they are they just have this white face, like ghost. They, they don't know what to do. We try to knock a little bit of that uh, green off of them so they're not quite such rookies when they hit the field. 
And then there's a huge safety aspect too, right? I mean, 26 story high rise, like we, we don't want to put anybody at risk. So they spend a tremendous time learning some safety. So we do try to expedite it as fast as we can. You know, our industry needs people so bad. You know, the average age of an electrician in the United States, I probably shared this with some of you, but I'll buy somebody lunch if you get it. 48. You're 56. Close. 57. I'll buy you lunch anyway, Sandy. 57, right? So just apply supply demand factors. The supply is going down. The demand for us Sparkies is going up, which for me personally is awesome as an electrician. But for us as a company, that's that's a that's the reverse trajectory, right? Um, how do we facilitate the work that's here in our market? It's just driving supply and or I mean, see the cost up. It's crazy. So the more that we can bring people into this industry and expedite them into the apprenticeship, uh, the better for all of us, right? Thank you so much, Cody. I think it's so valuable to see different models. Um, we love that you have a true pre-apprenticeship that leads into an apprenticeship program. Um, and then we know that many of those pre-apprenticeships in general, you actually get credit towards your full apprenticeship program because you've already accomplished some of the hours and, and some of the things that are required as part of that. So that is awesome. You know, you mentioned the concern about the A day, B day issue. And we actually have Stadler Rail here who's paved the way in, in trying to make that work and, and figuring out how to make that work with their partnership in Salt Lake City School District. So we will um, turn the time over to you, Domi and Katie, and I'll pull your presentation back up and you can chat about uh, the model that you guys are using. Great, thank you so much and thank you for having us. We're really excited to talk about our apprentice program anytime we get a chance to. So this is this is a really great platform. Ours, ours does differ uh, pretty drastically from what Cody just explained, but it's so great to hear about other, other platforms as well. So we're Stadler Rail and we have been in Utah for about six years only so um, if you've if you've gone to Wendover, you've probably seen our factory. We're just out here on 5600 West and I-80. You kind of can't miss us. Uh, it's a really big white building, and we usually have some really cool trains out on the tracks. So we are a rail manufacturer um, based out of Switzerland. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about the, the focus and the, the reason for our apprenticeship, and then I'll hand over all the details to Noemi because she's our expert. But if you want, we could just have a short video here to start that explains a good overview. We are a uh I'm train manufacturing company. Um, we are from Switzerland and um, just recently came over to the US. The program is a three year um, program. After the apprenticeship, we either offer them a full time position and they can grow into, you know, um, team lead or um, something else within the company. And then there is also the opportunity to maybe go into engineering. We want to prepare them for life. We're the community's college and advanced manufacturing is one of the fastest growing industries in the state of Utah. The only way we're going to be successful is to make sure that we get the, the young people exposed to these opportunities while they're in high school. The beauty of this apprenticeship is it allows someone to make an early decision in life. The fun part for that student is they're working 50% and they're going to school 50% their senior year in high school. Their growth truly is unlimited. I feel like the apprenticeship program has brought to light a bunch of different uh, communication skills. This provides a great opportunity for me to jumpstart because it gives me a solid basis of, of practical knowledge, and that's something that is very important. So I get to work with people who've been doing this for years and years, teaching me little tips and tricks on how to do certain things. At the same time, learning professionally, reading blueprints and schematics, all whilst learning through school. You need to know how to, how to be able to build something well um, to be able to design something well. And so it gives me a very strong basis for practical knowledge around building. The apprenticeship has helped me 
grow. They teach you like what's going on, how things work. I've enjoyed most working with different people. People who have different backgrounds. People who have different experiences working in the same company. I have uh, learned like so many different things like tools, what to use and how to solve problems way like easier than before. I would recommend them to do this because this is an opportunity that puts you way above your peers in speed of learning. When um, I arrived in the US for my first time, I realized that there's a need for talents and there's a need for real skilled workforce to train them with a program. Our apprentices, they're working between 28 hours and basically it depends on how many, um, how many classes they're taking. They can, they can take up to 40 hours or work up to 40 hours. We integrated the apprentices in the daily shift and the daily uh, tasks we have. We're planning with them. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for the society as well as for the businesses. It's a, a model of a public-private partnership. It's an investment in the talent, but it's also an investment in, in the community. Okay, do you, do you want to pull up our presentation, Melissa? Thank you. So, um, as you heard our CEO, Martin, say the reason that, that we set up this apprenticeship, and he came um, from Switzerland, and the, the Swiss apprentice model is something that's been in place for like 140 years or something over there. So they have it very, uh, very much figured out, fine-tuned. Noemi did an apprenticeship in, in Switzerland, and so she can speak to that a little bit if she wants to. But, um, you know, as Martin said, the reason that, that this apprenticeship was set up was to invest in the talent and provide um, our society and our community, or the children in our community or the youth, I guess they're not children, um, with an opportunity to earn and learn. And so we combine, like Hunt Electric does, um, paid work component with an educational component. So the apprentices attend Salt Lake Community College and they earn an advanced manufacturing um, associate's degree by the time they're done. And Noemi has a timeline that she'll go over that in a little bit more detail. But um, so we, we really do see like everyone else does a need to recruit, train and retain talent. And so if we can um, start that when these kids are in high school and we feel we can create some loyal um, and knowledgeable employees. So we do offer a zero debt education and then higher wages. So we pay for that entire degree and then provide these apprentices um, opportunities to become integrated in our workplace, which they work side by side with all of our employees. Um, okay, we can probably go to the next slide. Okay, yeah, I take it over from here. Um, you already saw me in the video. Um, I'm Noemi, and um, yeah, as um, Kay already mentioned, I did an apprenticeship back in Switzerland as a medical assistant um, before I actually um, continued with continuing the education um, later on, which um, you will see is also a possibility on our career path. So if we're going to um, look at this um, schedule, um, we are actually hiring um, our apprentice a little earlier um, in already in their um, senior year of high school. Um, so yeah, we kind of work with the A-B schedule, um, which yeah can be sometimes a little bit um, difficult, but I think we, we figured it out. Um, so our high school students, they work um, about 20 hours, um, sometimes less depending on the week, um, on the A or B days. Um, and then um, they go to school um, the other 50%, um, which is really important that they um, are being good condition in school because we need that high school diploma in order um, for them to go to um, the Salt Lake City Community College um, to get their AAS degree in advanced manufacturing. Um, yeah, so in their second year, um, they will work a little bit more, um, about 70%. So that makes up about 
28 hours. They can work more if they want to, as long as they um, are um, doing well at school. And um, yeah, the portion at school is about 30% of their, uh, their time. Um, and then in their last year, um, ideally the um, schoolwork will be less because um, they already have done a lot of um, their classes. So they will be here 80%, which is about 32 hours um, a week and go to the Salt Lake City Community College the rest of the time. Um, after about three years, um, they are graduating with an AAS degree in advanced manufacturing, um, and we have two paths there, a mechanical and an electrical path. Um, after that, um, we will hire them on as a full-time employee, or also if they are this, um, if they want to go a different route and yeah, go into higher education as well, um, then that will be um, a possibility to work a little bit less. And then um, actually we have um, reimbursement programs in place um, where we would help them with their continued education. Yeah, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so that's um, where you see that. So we have the automatization, um, automatic um, technician. So that's the electrical path. And then the production technician, um, that's more the mechanical path. And then um, on the left side, um, you see the different courses they have to take. Um, Peter maybe even um, can. Um, tell us a little bit more about that too if you want to um, but yeah they have general educations um, which we hope that they can take um, in their um, senior year already so they kind of have a head start there so they don't have to take it in their last two years um, and then we have technical courses and then also the apprenticeship capstone so those are the basically will they get paid when they are working here, right? And they come up with some goals each year and they will present those um, to um, the teacher um, in the end of the year. So um, they have time to work on it here um, as well. And, you know, like even taking pictures and stuff. So they kind of document their, their work um, and what they are learning and the cool thing is that they can they can really be creative they um, can choose what they like the most and maybe you know talk about that um, yeah if we can go to the next slide so that was our first um, group of apprentices um, they started um, 2019 so um, most of them will graduate and um, this then yeah the, the upcoming summer um that's actually our first group which is graduating from the program um which will be really exciting um next slide yeah so that's where our um electricians work um we have electrical pre-assembly and they also work on the trains um on the mechanical uh, on the electrical stuff um but that's um where they usually start off, um, how to they learn how to read blueprints and stuff like that, um, and you know work with with someone who teaches them how to put those panels together. Um, next slide, yeah, those are two of our apprentices. They are studying the blueprint, um, which um, is kind of the key. Um, even for mechanical, and then we bundle them up with um, with a trainer, so they work site on site with a trainer. Um, if they have questions or you know if there is an issue, we can actually like catch that pretty fast. Next slide, and then also this is our train. So um, one of our trains. So um, they they actually work like the video also was saying with with the whole team so they are actually working on the trains with which is which is really 
um, cool too. So they're like in the middle of everything. And um, yeah, so if they turn 18, we um, will get them some um, forklift and crane training uh, trainings too. So um, yeah, so they can actually already feel, feel how it is when they when they are done and have all those you know um, kind of trainings. Um, yeah. One other thing that I did want to mention is that about between uh, about I think it's about 18 percent of our apprentices are female. So we're really excited to to have that population it, it, as young as they are um, entering our workforce. It's great for that diversity. Peter, what did we miss? <laughs> well, you know, you, you two are, are such great spokespeople for for this apprenticeship model, and 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 one thing I do want to say is none of this would have happened without the involvement that 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 Stadler, um provided to this too. It it uh, it is a really great model, and it's something that I think is is serving Stadler well, and and will continue to serve a lot of other industry partners well too. We're we're in the process of really making this a, a statewide in initiative, which it really is, and really bringing in other industry partners as well. Um, I, I think maybe one of the things I would say is it's set up to be a youth apprenticeship. And it's really great that that we are able to create that experience for young people to, to try out the apprenticeship. You know, you, you ask young people and they get this question all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, they don't know what all the things are they can be, you know, much less what's interesting and what options are. And, and having these uh, uh, apprenticeships allows them to get a real experience to find out what it's really like to, to do a lot of these things, to, to find out what they like best too. You know, it, a, a, a productive employee is, is always going to be better if they're personally invested in, in what they're doing. You know, it's, it, work is always going to be a lot more fun if I'm doing something I'm interested in. So I think being able to give young people this this experience, you know, this this real hands-on experience is is so valuable, and it helps employers out too. You know, you get you get to preview, you know, a, a young apprentice to find out, you know, are they somebody that you want on your team and, and somebody that's that's going to be a good employee. And I think that's the other thing with this model too is it doesn't just focus on getting them the skills they need. It makes them a better employee. It makes them a better productive member of society. Even, you know, it's a, it's a much more holistic approach to it. You know, they, they get to find out what, what lean and six Sigma is, even though they don't have to deal with that every day, but it gives them an idea of why, what they do matters, why they need to, to be cognizant of the work they're doing because it goes to somebody else and it fits into a larger, piece and it, and it gives them the, this greater awareness that otherwise we we don't always get um, for apprentices. I, mean, I would just have to add, you know, um, this was a huge undertaking. And so uh, it, it took a little time to get it off the ground, but it helped us uh, see what we would need to do in order to move forward with others. Uh, one thing that I've always appreciated about Stadler and, and this program is they don't consider it Stadler's program. They consider it a youth apprenticeship program and they really want other employers who have mechanical assembly type positions or electrical assembly type positions that can uh, benefit, whose other students can benefit for, from the same type of training and have students be going together and doing some work-based learning there. Um, and be in the same classroom with each other, but then they may be employed with some of these other companies that hire for some of the same types of uh, positions. And so I think we had um, a question, but I think you kind of answered it already. You do hire uh, individuals and start them when they're a senior, so they are and can be under the age of 18, uh, and then you move them into some other things after they turn 18. Um, so unless anybody else had any questions and we can move right on into Peter's um, uh, presentation and then we'll have uh, more time at the end as well. Thank you, Melissa. Um, actually, you know, thank you, Katie and Noemi for covering a lot of the things 
um, about this program so I can make my presentation a bit shorter for everybody. Um, so if you want to skip to the fourth slide, I think. Familiar videos. Yeah, there we go. Oh, back one. Oh. I'm not good at counting today. <laughs> so this gets into a little more of the detail of what they're doing in the classroom um, and what they're what they're connecting to what they're doing on the production floor. So, you know, for their senior year in high school, ideally they would be able to get all their general eds done as concurrent enrollment while they're still in high school. Um, and you can see the different classes. And we handpicked some of those classes specifically because they fit into a lot of the things we're doing in the rest of the apprenticeship too, that, that leadership training. You know, everybody needs somebody that's going to be able to, to think critically and to be able to lead out instead of waiting for instruction. You know, it, it kind of leads itself into the, the whole work ethic thing. Um, and, and just being able to communicate, you know, sometimes we get technicians and, and uh, you know, just because it's a different skill set and they have to, to start putting together emails or putting together reports, and they don't, they're not necessarily all that great at it because they, they haven't gone through that so much. So we, we specifically did that in our general education. And, and again, ideally, they would do this all while they're still in high school. But if for some reason they didn't, and we'll talk about different pathways too, they still have the opportunity to take those classes throughout the rest of their apprenticeship. Um, and then the technical courses, that's, that's where the really fun parts are, um, at least, you know, for a lot of us that like to put our hands on things. And they get they get a lot of those fundamental concepts that they can tie directly to what they're doing at work. And in fact, in, in most of these classes, all the discussions are based around, okay, here's what we learned about, but tell us how you find that in your workplace. How does this, how do you see, how did you find that same thing at work? You know, we talk about like something like corrosion. We'll go find some examples at work of, of corrosion or corrosion prevention. So we we're always really careful to tie those two things very closely together so that there's not this separation between, well, classroom time and, and work time. It becomes a little more just all the time. So they're, because they're learning a lot at work, they're learning a lot in school. We want them to, to have those things be more like one experience and not these two big separate things. Um, and what's nice about this model too, is we did design it so we can develop additional tracks. If you're, you're somebody that's in manufacturing and, and say, well, the mechanical is great, the electrical is great, but I have composites technicians. I want, I want to you know, be able to do that. Those four classes that are grayed out, those are essentially what changes when you change a track. So if I were to create another composites track, I would get rid of those four grayed out classes and I would have four composites oriented classes in its place. So this, this model really was designed to, to be able to serve as many industries and as many people as we could so that it can be this this overall system that that kind of helps create that pipeline for our workforce the last piece is is a really great piece too when you're at work and this is what apprenticeships are really kind of all about when you're at work you're learning a lot of things all the time all day long every day and we wanted to honor that that learning that was going on and because this is a, a you know a, a four credit program, you get an AAS from it. We wanted to be able to award college credit for that all that massive amount of learning that's happening while they're on the job. <laughs> so, like Katie and Noemi um, talked about at the beginning of the year, we sit down with each apprentice, and not just the apprentice, but the apprentice, their mentor at the host company, and the educational partner. All those three people together every time we talk about this to come up with three learning objectives for that apprentice. What does that apprentice want to learn this year while they're at work? You know, they've had a chance to, to see what happens and see what they're interested in. And now if I'm a, a mechanical apprentice, well, maybe I want to know more about the pneumatic system on trucks. And, you know, maybe I want to get my crane certification. You know, we, we, we allow them to together, you know, with these, these three, you know, pieces to come up with their learning objectives, what they're going to learn. And that's what's great about having the, the mentor from the host company because, you know, we can come up with learning objectives, but if the company doesn't have the ability to put that person in that position to get that experience, it doesn't do us any good. You know, we have the education educational partner there to say, okay, yeah, the, these, are, these are very valid 
learning objectives, let's make them part of that. So it's it's a group effort. It's it's never anybody just out alone trying to trying to make their own way. Um, then of course at the end of the year, that apprentice gets to demonstrate that they met those learning objectives. So that gets them college credit for that experience they're getting at work because they're just learning so much there. Um, and the other piece on the on the next slide. Again, it, it was meant to be a youth apprenticeship, but it's not exclusive either. I mean, you know, Katie and Mimi can attest to this. We've had some apprentices that had already graduated high school, but wanted to get in this apprenticeship program. And so this allows for that too. You know, ideally you'd be a high school senior and take all your general eds as concurrent enrollment. But if you've already graduated, you can still get in this apprenticeship program and you can still take those general ed classes throughout your apprenticeship. Um, either way, everybody still takes that same group of technical courses. They, they get that same credit for the work they're doing um, at the workplace. It's just their schedule looks a little bit different, but they can all get to the same place. And I think unless there's questions, that's all I was going to add. Peter, why don't you share with us kind of um, where you see things going, um, kind of your your vision for the future. I know you're working on some things and then also the Talent Ready uh, Connection Grants as a resource to help with this. Great. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Actually, you know, I'll start off with the last one first. Um, the Talent Ready Connections Grant um, has specifically um, budgeted money towards these youth apprenticeships. Um, because it, it is something important that's that that is really going to help all of the industry in Utah, and it really helps a lot of our young people too. Um, so we still have um, some current funding right now that we we have yet yet to spend um, for different education institutions to put together similar apprenticeships. You know, and and really our role in that as Talent Ready Utah is as a convener. We're here to help connect people. You know, we're very industry faced because we never want to create something that industry doesn't want or need. So we want to make sure whatever we create is going to be exactly, well, maybe maybe I shouldn't use the word exactly, but it's really close to, to what, they, what they're looking for, what they need, what they need to, to do business. Because if, if a student has what that employer needs, they're going to get employed. Um, so really, we're out there having conversations um, every day, a lot of times, multiple times a day. Um, to really engage industry, to get them to see what this model is and to get them to see that the benefit of apprenticeships in, in general, and especially for those industries that haven't typically used apprenticeships. You know, we, we've been talking a lot to the, the finance industry. We've talk, been talking to healthcare, where, you know, usually you say apprenticeship, you think of the trades, but, you know, Noemi can, uh, can speak to this a little bit more too, but, you know, in Switzerland, there's an apprenticeship for almost everything you can think of. And, and I think there's a lot of room in the U.S. here to develop that, that same kind of idea to create these apprenticeships in places where they weren't before. Um, because as, as educators, we all know, if you give a, a young person a chance to work on a real world problem, they get personally invested in it and they learn a lot from that experience. Sometimes what they learn is, well, maybe this isn't the right thing for me, but usually that's not the case. They, they get such a more in-depth, intimate knowledge of, of what they've been trying to learn when they can actually put their hands on it, do it themselves, whether it's, you know, wiring up a PLC or, you know, arranging spreadsheets for a financial transaction. Um, so that's, that's a big part of what Talent Ready Utah is, is doing right now is getting the word out and, and really showing people the, and especially industry, the value of this model. Thank you, Peter. And I think you hit on a key thing. Sometimes what students learn is this is not the job for them. <laughs> and, you know, that's still a win because uh, if they learn these things earlier on, then they don't go down the road of applying and investing in, in time and effort and training. So I think um, that's a great segue into uh, chatting with Sandy. Uh, Sandy and I have these long-term vision plans. Our, our, what we talk about, if, if we were keen for a day or in our perfect world, <laughs> this, this is how things would work. And it's really about uh, providing students options 
uh, getting to them early and uh, helping them identify what they like, what they don't like, and what they have the aptitude for and um, what they don't earlier before they make a full on commitment into an apprenticeship program. So Sandy, why don't you uh, chat about uh, that? And you know, if you have more to add about some of your partnerships uh, like with Hunt and, and others that are leading to that, that would be great. So Melissa, if I skip something, tell me. Um, I um, kind of took notes as, as we were going through and wrote down a couple of things. Um, the first one is the concept of quality with the, the concept of apprenticeship. Um, I had someone call me the other day and they said, we offer this apprenticeship. And I said, tell me about it. And it was a two week training program. And I said, well, that kind of isn't an apprenticeship. And they said, well, we'll hire after. And I said, it still is not an apprenticeship. So really coming and having a definition that helps us as we work together, maintain quality of apprenticeship. Um, if you looked at Stott Laurel and you looked at Hunt, very different models, and yet both really have that quality and that over time growth for the individual. The other thing that really kind of hit me as I was listening is the need to move work-based learning experiences we've always done back. Um, I heard you guys talk about the fact that you know, this is also could be a time when students making a choice, do I like this, do I not like this, which I think will happen. But based on the cost for an employer to really take on an apprentice in the full model, I think it's really good if we could do the internships like we do between the summer, junior and senior year that summer, because kids have a, a chance to look at what that job would be and say, you know what, I thought I wanted to do this but I don't think I do. And, and I would think that's so much better for the employers if they would say that before they started the apprenticeship versus during the apprenticeship. So um, really thought a lot about that. Um, Cody, you also talked about two things and I do have to tell you that Granite listened to employers. Um, so our A days now are on Monday and Wednesdays. And our B days are on Tuesdays and Thursdays within a rotational Friday. But what we heard from so many people is how do you tell an A day or B day? Yeah. And in all honesty, if you asked me today or a year ago, I would have had to have gone and found the calendar and say, oh, today's this and it's a B day. So we actually have shifted how we operate so that you always know minus that rotational Friday Mondays and Wednesdays are A days, Tuesdays and Thursdays are B days, which makes it easier for us to work with colleges and to work with industry who are saying, okay, we want to work with you, but can you kind of define how we could do that? So that's kind of my first piece. The second piece I hear from companies all the time, and I heard it again today, is liability. How do we deal with the liability? And as soon as you start paying, workers' comp falls to the company. So if it's unpaid, it's on district's workers' comp. If it's paid, it's on company's workers' comp. The power, though, of what this state has done is if the student, and, and this is really important, if the student is in a course, they would be in a course called apprenticeship at the district as a minor the state carries a liability policy for negligence. So if the kid dropped a hammer and ruined your machine um, in a hospital, they always say, well, what if they drop water on the floor and someone slips? Um, the state carries a sizable liability policy to help companies if something happens. So as you talk to your insurers, say, why don't you talk to the state and let's look at how we can work through this. The key is they have to be in a course in the district. It can't be them coming back and saying, oh, I'm on this apprenticeship, but it's really with the district. It isn't unless there's a course. So if you have a student say to you, I don't need the credit, you say, I don't care if you want to be in it, you have to be in the course. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's important. And I think it will open maybe some discussions because 
The interesting thing is everybody seems to need workforce. Mm -hmm. I have never been at the point that my door is revolving. Um, and in fact, Cody, I had another electrical group come and they told me that they were as good or better than you. <laughs> we hear you work with Hunt. And I said, Hunt has been our partner for years. And oh. you know, I so appreciate it. But they had heard about our partnership with you. That's funny. And so they told us they were better. I'll take that as a compliment. You should. You should. Because they kind <laughs> of am trying to prove to me this scale. And I, I said, no, we love Hunt. Um, you know what? They've worked with us so closely. But I think that if we as a group can start talking about the problems and what's stopping us from doing apprenticeship effectively, and especially getting kids in before they leave high school, whether it's summer internship or something else, I have to tell you that if you lose the kid, if they graduate, many of those students already, at least in our district, have jobs in fast food. They've been working there for a long time. They're the night manager. They may be your perfect employee because they have all the work skills, but you'll never get them for years until they realize that they can't go anywhere. And so I think that connection um, between before they leave high school is so crucial if we're going to keep students. Melissa, you asked me to say one other thing and I don't have a clue what you asked. Uh, that's a good question, Sandy. I just was so intrigued with everything that you were saying <laughs> that I may have forgotten as well. But no, I think um, what I was thinking of is we talk about uh, just opportunities earlier on to help them make better decisions. And mm -hmm. so, you know, sometimes when we talk to employers, they aren't completely sold um, on working with junior high students or even el elementary level students. But we have seen at, um, real life experiences where we've seen the value of STEM Fest, the value of Pathways to Professions, the value of what used to be construction career days, which evolved into Utah career days. All of those things we have seen uh, the value in. And I've got a couple of personal examples that I can even share. Um, I have a, a, a child that's 14 now, but his first experience um, in career exploration was a STEM fest and uh, he was uh, six or seven and he got to build a paper rocket and shoot it right then and there. After that, he knew there was a company that builds rockets in Utah. So is he gonna decide he wants to build rockets at that age? No, but now he knows that it even exists where he wouldn't have known that it, it even existed. Uh, Staker Parsons does a great program in fourth grade that I had them bring to our school, our my kids' elementary school, um, where they take a chocolate chip cookie and a paper clip, and you have to mine the chocolate chips out of it, and then you have to reclaim them and reclaim the land. So, you know, they talked about mining and reclamation, but also the other jobs that they do and the rock trucks that you see on the road and you know all the things that they do. In fourth grade, he learned that, oh, that's what those things are, that's what they do. Um, my oldest, he's 20, he went to his first um, construction career days. I was involved with bringing that to Utah. So we had the first pilot program in 2005 down in St. George, and then moved it up to, to Salt Lake um, City. And he, we had his daycare come and do a part, be a part of a family night. And at first, the employers felt like, oh, maybe that wasn't successful. We saw about 100 people come through. Well, those 100 people were parents. <laughs> and you got to start somewhere, <laughs> right? And uh, they, all they did was they had a hands-on activity where they had um, the kids build a birdhouse or a toothbrush holder, little kits with little hammers and little aprons from Home Depot. Well, that was his first experience in construction. Oh, you build things, you make things, you use nails. This is what you're able to do. Um, Staker Parsons there had their huge sand pit with all the different types of trucks and um, heavy equipment that they could use in that. All these things that you wouldn't normally think of as career exploration. But I bring this up because it's those things that you start to plant the seeds and then you build on them. So they have the career exploration and then uh, they're able to do some industry tours and, and see things on site. Oh, this is what this really is. This is who this company is. This is what this job really entails. 
Um, you have people come to the classroom and talk to them. Uh, then you pro do project-based learning. And it, all of these things are hands-on things and tangible and things that they remember. Um, I was talking to somebody uh, earlier today about um, education and apprentices. And, you know, when we teach someone how to read, we, we do it by, you learn by doing, right? You don't learn how to read by listening. You have to have someone help you and then you practice and then you get better at reading. That's basically what an apprenticeship is. But we want to help prepare those students earlier on to make those choices so that it is value added for our employers. But we all have a role to play and it can happen earlier on. And I think all of these value, these things just um, build and stack on each other. We just need to continue and, you know, look at all of these ways that we can do that. I get on a soapbox in case you can't tell. I'm a little bit passionate about this. Very, very well said, though. <laughs> so I, I really think if we as um, education and employers and government all get together and look at the issues, then the question is, how do we solve those? Whether it's through legislation that helps the employer with liability issues or, but I think, like I say, I think helping students, if they're ready, move to that apprenticeship, um, I was working with some kids about another apprenticeship and they stopped me and they said, if we do this during the day, can I get off in time to go to my night job? And I started laughing and I said, well, you know, you'll be paid during the day. And they said, no, I have to have the money for my family. We're a poverty district, have to have the money for my family. So, um, and and that's that's a hard balance because those kids, some of them have been working there for four since fourteen, so they're making pretty good money. How do we how do we deal with the issues? And and all of us, as I'm listening, need workforce. So how do we help kids before they leave get connected with a vision of who they can be? Cody, I love your company because I think they help. I, I we get kids coming back that work for you saying this is where I am and this is what I'm doing. But they knew that before they got to, left high school. They yeah. knew that they were coming and, and I think we need to do that broader. Yeah, and I think too, um, I think one thing I try to be very mindful of is letting people know that apprenticeships are post-secondary education. There's an education component to this. And so I just think it, it takes us as educators thinking differently um, and seeing the value, and again, being multiple pathways to success, right? You can go into a tech school, the community college, the university, or you can get into an apprenticeship and still have that value added um, education. Um, right now in Utah, we have more individuals with degrees than we have jobs that require degrees. Now, does that mean degrees aren't important? Absolutely not. They absolutely are. There's always going to be some jobs you have to have a degree in order to do that job, and that's okay. But I like, you know, Cody's example of the stepping stone. You get credit towards your degree. Um, Stadler's results in an associate's degree. Um, my oldest son that I was telling you about a, a minute ago, he um, started down the path of going to Weber State University because he wanted to do building design and construction, be a project manager and was doing really well, had two scholarships, and then COVID hit. He found out very quickly he was not an online learner. I knew that all along about him and tried to prime him to do an apprenticeship for years, but you know, he knew better than mom did. <laughs> and, and he would have been a good student. He was a good student, just not an online student. Well, he was gonna lose his scholarships, so he dropped one class and then took one for non-credit and felt really defeated because he had put a lot of time and effort into and the work that he did um, for his college level courses and to it not yield anything. And now what was he going to do? Um, well, he remembered his employer had an apprenticeship program, decided to do that. He'll graduate this spring and he will almost be finished with his degree because he will be getting credit towards it. So now he's like, hey, this worked out better in the long run and I'm gonna be a better project manager because now I have the field experience to go along with the education and his employer feels the same way. And they told him, Ty, if you want to continue on, you know, we'll finish helping you with your degree as well. So I think it's just all these opportunities that I think people are unaware of and different ways to get to where you want to be. Um, and so 
I think it takes groups like this, and just like you said, uh, Sandy, uh, policy makers, and, but we need the feedback from the employers, right? These are the things that are working for us and not working for us, and this is what we need to do to help engage. And then educators, this is the problem that I have. I wanna send you students, but when I have this, this, and this requirement, you know, to pass for testing or different things like that, how do we uh, work together um, to strengthen and um, look at how we get past those barriers uh, so that we can have more programs like this? So um, I think this right here speaks to the desire and the partnership that we do have to start moving forward. And we hope that we continue these conversations this has been a great week, um, National Apprenticeship Week, to start some of these conversations or to extend them. Uh, but this certainly isn't just a one week out of the year thing. Uh, we really want this to be the beginning. And, and where do we go from here? So I think, let me check the chat. Hopefully I've uh, clicked to Tim. Thanks. Uh, one more question. Cody, if you wouldn't mind, would you share a little bit about your experience? Because I think you hit on something really important. I mean, if the Department of Labor is allowing us to work as, as young as 16, but insurance will not, that's a problem. So what conversation did you have with the insurance company? And quite honestly, even if the Department of Labor aligned with insurance and said, yes, we can start as soon as 16, would you anyway? Oh, man, that is a great question. Tim, I think you set me up a little bit. But no, honestly, uh, the insurance companies are tricky. Um, it was just kind of a flat across the board with our insurance company that 18 was going to be the delineator or the threshold before we would hire on employees. If I'm not mistaken, I believe at the state level, Doppel will allow you to be an electrical apprentice at 16 as well. And so some of those smaller contractors, um, you know, like I said, we're we're kind of a behemoth when it comes to electrical contractors. So there's a lot of rules and regulations, but I think those smaller guys, those smaller shops have a little bit more leverage and flexibility navigating that whole insurance piece, especially if maybe you're the owner and it's your son working for you, right? There's some unique dynamics that way. So we just kind of make it a, made it a clear line across the board. 18's kind of where we're going to cut that off. Um, so I don't think we would entertain anybody younger than that summer intern who's 17. Yeah, to speak, to speak to what Cody was just saying, sorry. Um, we do have up here at Ogden Weber Technical College, we do have a couple of apprentices that were in that um, 16 range and started their apprenticeship, um, finished their um, first year apprenticeship um, during the day while they were going to high school. And then, you know, their company worked it out with them. They went to work part of the time and came to school part of the time during the day while they were still in high school. And now they've graduated high school and they're um, moved on to their second year and that's at night. So there are some companies that do it, but yeah, they like hunt. There's big companies that, you know, just can't, can't get around it. What we're hoping is that through this PIA network that we're a part of, that we can start um, benefiting from the road that they've paved. We've got systematic youth apprenticeship programs that are statewide in Wisconsin, in Tennessee, in North Carolina, in South Carolina, in Kentucky. And so, you know, they've been at this for a few years now. Uh, Colorado is another big one where they can share their resources and, and share with us what it was they did to talk to the insurance companies or what they had to put in place. And again, it's not gonna work for everyone. It's not gonna work for every company. It's not gonna work for every individual. Um, I, I don't think Ty could have done this at the age of 16. <laughs> he had too many other priorities. And, um, and so it wouldn't have been the right fit for him at that time. But for those that we know that can be, then you know what is it that we do for them? And so hopefully we're, we're gonna be able to learn from, from some of those um, efforts and some of those partners. I, I know Brecken and, and Peter and I and Sandy uh, and Alexia, we really want to look at, okay, now that we've done a pilot and now that we have some others that are interested, how do we scale that? Um, and so we'll be developing more resources. 
and, and putting them on apprenticeship.utah.gov. That's the, the state's comprehensive site right now. Uh, there's uh, particular sec uh, the sections that are divided out are for employers, future apprentices, and educators. And uh, every time we, we find something new, uh, we'll make sure that that's where we're putting it. And we'll be you know, sharing these resources as we develop them and, and receive them with our partners as well. So we are at time at 431. I wanna be mindful uh, of your time, but I wanna thank you all for coming. We really appreciate um, all of you being here and for our presenters. Uh, this has been great and we look forward to the continued conversation. Thanks guys. See ya. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.